Hello everyone. Today we'll talk about Kubert at the cost of containerizing VMs. I am a master's student from Japan. I've been researching on container and lightweight virtualization technologies. I joined the Google Summer of Code program in 2020 and I worked uh, under Libred organization and contributed to SourceStack open source project. I implemented features and support advanced performance tuning. I feel truly grateful to have Dario and Vasily in the team. Dario is an experienced virtualization specialist and SUSE. He has been working on both Zen and KVM projects. Vasily is a senior software engineer and SUSE. He has been working on container and VM convergence technologies. He is also an active uh, contributor at Kubert. Both of them are very kind and supportive. Today's uh, specific topic is about the performance evaluation and tuning of KVM and Kubert. Uh, throughout the talk, we will show you the effect of vCPU pinning and virtual topology on VM's performance, as well as uh, available tuning capabilities on both KVM and Kubert. We will also explain some cases where improper tuning can actually lead to quite a significant performance loss. Just a quick recap. KVM is an open source virtualization solution that is built into the Linux kernel, which runs on x86 machines. Kubert is a Kubernetes add-on that allows you to manage VMs and containers in a unified manner. Here is an interesting comparison of KVM and Kubert. Uh, with KVM, you have the full control of tuning capabilities, which also can be a disadvantage because tuning can be complex. In addition, you can decide where the VM runs with a traditional approach, but managing them can quickly become troublesome if you have thousands of them. This is why Kubert came into play. Um, Kubert inherits a Kubernetes capability to orchestrate the VMs at scale. It hides the VM configuration uh, complexities uh, behind the high-level YAML definition, which also turns out to be a disadvantage since you don't have uh, full control of all the VM uh, parameters. It's worth mentioning that the container runtime might introduce some overhead due to resource uh, usage accounting or limitations. From now on, Dario will talk about the environment setup and tuning. Hi, everyone. So since this talk is about the results of some um, experiments that we have run, let's have a look at the experimental setup. We used a 32 physical CPUs server, both as the KVM host and as the Cube Virt worker node, which basically means this is the hardware where the VMs were actually running in both configurations. It had two Numa nodes with eight cohorts each and hyperthreading enabled, as you can see in this slide, together with some more information about it. And this is how uh, our server looks like if you ask it to LS Topo. As host, we used an Ubuntu LTS. Uh, we used the latest available CubeVirt release, uh, which was uh, 0.44, at, uh, and which includes Kimu 5.2 and LibVirt 7. For the KVM experiments, we built from sources and used uh, the very same versions of those uh, software components. We run uh, our experiments inside a 1vCPU uh, VM and then we repeated them inside a 4vCPU VM, CPUs VM. The VM had 8 gigabytes of RAM in both cases and was running OpenSUSE Leap 15.2. We used MM tests as our benchmark in Suite as it can orchestrate running benchmark inside one or even multiple VMs. We have run several benchmarks and we have considered multiple configurations for uh, many of those benchmarks. We run cyclic tests uh, with the wake-up threads either pinned uh, to the vCPUs or not. We run NAS with uh, OpenMP and with two threads uh, running in parallel in the four vCPUs VM, of course, and executing the various computational kernels. We also run stream also with two threads still in the four vCPUs VM. We run Arcbench with either two or four groups of thread resulting in quite a few communicating tasks. We run Kernbench with either one, two or four build jobs in parallel and we run IOZone for synchronous I.O. with different file sizes. We run all those benchmarks inside a 1vCPU VM and then inside a 4vCPU VM as I said. And we consider different load conditions for the host too. We uh, run them on uh, idle host. We run with 50% load on the host 
without considering our VM, and with 100% load on the host, again, without considering our VM. For generating the load on the host, we used various stress and G threads in, uh, launched in a way that they can uh, simulate having other VMs running at the same time of our, of our one and the host. And in this presentation, uh, we will show a subset of the results that we uh, achieved. So, how can we tune the performance of a VM? Well, one way of doing that is uh, doing some kind of static or semi-static resource partition. This means doing vCPU and memory pinning, and maybe doing uh, vir <coughs> sorry, defining virtual topology for uh, the VM as well. We can also hope to improve performance using huge pages, isolating the vCPUs from the interference of any I.O. activity, and a couple of other things. Using huge pages or large pages means using memory pages bigger than the default 4 kilobytes for baking the VM memory. This improves performance because working the various level of the page tables for translating guest virtual addresses into host physical addresses add to happen less often, lowering the pressure on the TLB, and when it happens, it is also faster. If our VM has more than one vCPU, we can define a virtual topology for it, which means that its virtual CPUs can be arranged in virtual cores with virtual threads, uh, virtual sockets, and even virtual NUMA nodes. The software running inside of the VM then, both the kernel and user space programs, will see such a topology and will make assumptions and try to make uh, optimizations basing uh, on this information. VCPUs can be pinned to the host physical CPUs. That means that the host scheduler will only be allowed to move the VCPUs around the various PCPUs within certain limits, if at all. Using pinning can be very effective for cutting down the overhead of VCPUs migration, for achieving more consistent uh, performance results, and even more important for partitioning the host resources, physical CPUs in this case among the various VMs, uh, or in general, among the various uh, entities and activities that we have running on the host. And, of course, we can try to combine vCPU pinning and virtual topology, and achieve at least potentially very good results. If we uh, pin uh, vCPUs in such a way that the virtual topology that uh, has been defined for the VM matches the physical topology of the group of PCPUs where the vCPUs of the VM run. We can, however, also completely mess up our own performance if we badly mismatch the guest and host topologies, for example, uh, for instance, by pinning vCPUs of a virtual core on PCPUs from different physical cores, and even worse if we also get the resource partitioning part uh, wrong. If we are pinning the vCPUs on the PCPUs of a specific NUMA node, then it also makes sense to uh, try to make sure that the memory of the VM is entirely allocated on that NUMA node to avoid the latency of um, remote memory access. And there are um, also a couple of other things that we can do, uh, but uh, I am not uh, <coughs> sorry, going into um, other details about them in this presentation for time reasons. It is, yes, also possible to uh, cut out um, of Kimu the uh, threads that deal with uh, I.O. events in the attempt to improve the scalability of I.O. Uh, and isolate the VCPU from uh, interference of I.O. itself. And we actually did some experiments with these uh, settings, but again, I will not go into details and we will not show uh, the results for time reasons. Uh, finally, still about I.O., we saw that for our configuration, uh, which uses a pre-allocated raw image uh, as the disk of the VM, using the native I.O. model was uh, uh, really important. For instance, I.O. zone, the benchmark, wasn't even able to finish unless we used uh, I.O. equal to native. We are ter therefore using it for uh, all the uh, configurations that we show results uh, of. And yeah, apart from that, uh, um, IO tuning at the virtual device level happens by specifying uh, caching mode and whether or not we have and we want to use multi-queuing. Now, for KVM, in our experiments, we considered four different configurations. The default one, so no pinning at all for the vCPUs and no virtual topology defined for the VM. Then a 
pinning default and a pinning one. Let's call them uh, like that, where we do one-to-one -one vCPU pinning for both, and either leave the virtual topology as the default one or define a custom one with all the vCPUs uh, uh, defined as cores of the same socket. Finally, we checked the fully tuned setup, or at least what we call the fully tuned setup, where we do one-to-one -one vCPU pinning, uh, coupled together with perfect guest-to-host virtual topology uh, mapping. And yeah, for reference, this is how we uh, specify each of these uh, configurations in the libvirt VM um, XML file. Of course, we expect that it is the uh, best tuned configuration that um, will give us the best results. Let's see if it's true. For kubevert, we try to do the same. Uh, however, in this case, it is uh, Kubernetes and Kubevert uh, that are in control of the uh, VM configuration details, such as where the vCPUs are pinned and how the virtual topology is defined. So this is again for reference uh, how we uh, tried to uh, achieve the same configuration that I showed before for KVM, and this is all we can do. Uh, so basically uh, specifying the topology and uh, asking for uh, the vCPU to be pinned in the VMI YAML file. But check the results, especially for the VTune case, which was supposed to be uh, the best one. The topology has been defined and the pinning has been established, but the mapping between virtual threads and physical threads is actually wrong and uh, there is really nothing that uh, we can do, at least not for now, uh, about it, because that's entirely under kubevert uh, uh, control. So, well, I think this means that we should probably expect weird results, especially from this configuration uh, on the kubevert side, which was indeed supposed to be the best one. But again, let's see. Here is our benchmarking result of a memory bandwidth. Uh, in KVM, the default case without vCPU pinning performs pretty well because the host scheduler can manage to move the vCPU around in a way that leads to good performance. For example, the host scheduler can put vCPUs in different cores since the host is doing nothing and the sibling threads will not interfere with each other. It will still give us pretty good performance as you can see from the graph here. On the other hand, if we pin the vCPU without concerning about the host topology, we might end up in a situation where two vCPUs happen to be siblings at the host level and compete with each other for resources, which explain why we have some significant performance drop here. Uh, if we pin the vCPU in a way that matches with the host uh, topology, v in our case, we're guaranteed to get the best performance, as you can see from the graph here. We tune the vCPU in Kubert. The virtual topology does not match with the host topology. Unfortunately, there is not much we can do since a vCPU pinning is out of a Kubert's control. That's because CPU allocation is managed by a CPU manager in Kubernetes, and the Kubert has no control on what vCPUs will be allocated. To further confirm our understanding, we put some medium load uh, on a host, as you can see from the graph. The performance gap between default and tuned cases are becoming smaller. This is even more obvious when we put high loads on the host. There is almost no difference between default and tuned cases in uh, It perhaps because uh, when all vCPUs are busy, the topology is probably not too important. The trend is pretty much the same in uh, NASA parallel benchmark. However, we have a more quantitative measure of CPU performance. It basically runs different kinds of metrics uh, computation. VTune still guaranteed uh, the best performance in KVM. Default configurations can manage well with the help of a host scheduler, but the difference is small when the host is idle. Uh, when we put load on the host, the improvement of v2 is more obvious and uh, in the kubert case since topology is mismatched the vcpus are pinned 
host scheduler does not even has a freedom to move the vCPU around, which leads to quite a bit of performance loss and inconsistent result. There is a similar trend in cyclic test, uh, but we can clearly see the benefits of pinning. The topology is probably not that important here because uh, cyclic test is just waking threads up and doing some computations and going to sleep. For the unbounded case, the situation is similar, except that latency will be larger compared to pin cases. However, one thing we still don't understand is that in KVM, the latency for the idle case is smaller than the pin case. We're actually still investigating the reasons. Current bench is different from uh, previous benchmarks. Uh, we're essentially running tax to using one, two, and four vCPUs. Whereas uh, previous benchmarks use only half of all those four vCPUs. As you can see from the graph, when there is only one uh, thread running, pinned configurations outperform default ones. Since there is no overhead of a CPU migration, all pinned configuration beats a default case. When we start running two threads, VTunes outperform default configuration by very little, which is uh, what we expect. Uh, out of, of course, a uh, mismatched topology suffers. Uh, when we saturate all, VC, uh, all CPUs, uh, the default configuration outperforms in all cases, again, because uh, the host scheduler can put those uh, threads in four different cores. This is perhaps our favorite uh, benchmark, not only because it matches with all previous results, but it also showed us the whole picture of how different configurations uh, behave in the case of one, two, and four vCPUs. Disk I.O. performance is a complicated one. It could be affected by either CPU memory cache or the combination of them. For now, we just want to show you a general tendency. There is not much difference between uh, KVM and Kubert in the case of a sequential read. Um, However, we see larger standard deviation where we put uh, some loads on host. And of course, we see small performance drop when the host is highly loaded. Random reads uh, show similar tendency and that there is some significant performance drop uh, compared to sequential read, which is uh, what we expect. After all, it's, uh, it's random read. Uh, same goes for sequential writes. Uh, random writes experience a large performance drop. Overall, we don't see much difference between KVM and Kubert. It's not surprising because uh, we're using the same kind of uh, disks, backend, and configurations. To conclude, we have found out uh, matching your host CPU topology in the VMs can guarantee good performance, but mismatching ones can lead to great uh, performance loss. In general, the host scheduler can manage really well in the default case, only if there is not much load on the host. There are some uh, inherent limitations of uh, Kubert with uh, CPU pinning, since CPU allocation is managed by CPU manager in Kubernetes. We cannot do much about it. I guess this is perhaps the trade-off they have to make, because uh, it contradicts uh, with the idea of uh, automatic orchestration. But still, Default configuration works quite well in general. Uh, last, I think Kubert can actually be improved to avoid a mismatching uh, CPU topology. And uh, this is the end of the presentation. Thank you for listening and uh, please don't hesitate uh, to contact us if you have any questions. Uh, we're happy to discuss anything. Again, thanks Dario and Vasily for all the support along the way. Last of all, we really appreciate the KVM committees for organizing this event. I uh, hope to see you guys again.